Hello everybody, and welcome back to the Western Sano Point of Care Ultrasound Series. My name is Katie Wiskar, and I'm the current Western University Critical Care Ultrasound Fellow. I'm going to be speaking to you today about aortic valve disease and distinguishing aortic sclerosis from aortic stenosis. Many thanks to Dr. Robert Arnfield for all of his help with this project. A few caveats before we start. First, this screencast assumes a basic understanding of spectral Doppler. For a refresher, I direct you to Dr. Robert Arnfield's screencast on stroke volume determination using LVOT VTIs. This is found on the westernsono.ca website, and a link to the screencast is found in the video description below. Second, this short screencast is evidently not intended to cover a comprehensive evaluation of aortic valve disease. In particular, evaluation of both bioprosthetic and mechanical valves is best left to an expert echocardiographer, given the inherent complexity of that task. Aortic valve disease, of course, exists along a continuum, where aortic sclerosis reflects valve thickening without any actual impairment of valve function. Progression to aortic stenosis, on the other hand, reflects impaired valve function, relative obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract, and the presence of hemodynamically significant gradients across the aortic valve. The detection of severe aortic stenosis is a clinically important question as it can have marked hemodynamic consequences, both in the operating room, on the wards, and in the intensive care unit. And patients will often arrive to us, whether in preoperative clinic, in a busy emergency department, or coming to the ICU critically ill, with a new systolic murmur that has not previously been documented or no recent echocardiogram on file. Now we do have physical exam tools that can help us distinguish the presence of severe aortic stenosis. However, these are far from perfect and are sometimes not practical or available to us in a busy emergency room or in a noisy ICU. In contrast, with bedside echocardiography and some simple spectral Doppler applications, we can definitively answer the question as to whether severe aortic stenosis is impacting this patient's hemodynamics. There is some good evidence that this technique is feasible and easily taught to trainees. In this study, anesthesia residents with no prior echo experience had one day of instruction around evaluation for aortic stenosis using the technique described in this video. Their performance was then compared to that of expert echocardiographers, and they found 100% concordance between trainees and consultant echocardiographers for the detection of clinically significant aortic stenosis with zero cases of misdiagnosis. Particularly for people with prior experience with spectral Doppler, this technique is a very natural extension. We'll start off by reviewing some of the common two-dimensional findings that are associated with severe aortic stenosis. This first shot demonstrates a normal parasternal long axis view with a normal aortic valve. You can appreciate the thin aortic valve leaflets that are opening well. In contrast, in this somewhat challenging parasternal long axis view, you can nevertheless appreciate a very calcified aortic valve that is hardly opening. We also see some associated findings that often accompany severe aortic stenosis, such as left ventricular hypertrophy. This is a zoomed in parasternal long axis view that once again demonstrates hyperechoic calcified valve leaflets with significantly reduced valve opening. From a parasternal short axis view at the level of the aortic valve, we can see here a tri-leaflet valve that is heavily calcified and demonstrating reduced opening. And from an apical five-chamber view, we visualize those same findings, a hyperechoic bright calcified aortic valve with minimal movement that makes us suspicious for the presence of a hemodynamically significant aortic valve disease. Having reviewed all of those two-dimensional findings, in the evaluation for severe aortic stenosis, spectral Doppler really is key. All of those same 2D findings can be seen in aortic sclerosis as well as in severe aortic stenosis. And the key to differentiating is the application of spectral Doppler in an apical five-chamber as we'll demonstrate here. As a reminder, we use an apical five-chamber view given that it gives us the best alignment to measure velocities and pressure gradients across the aortic valve with blood flowing parallel to our probe. As with measuring cardiac outputs, if your image is off axis and your blood flow is not parallel to the angle of incination of your probe, you may be underestimating your gradients. In addition, as with measuring LVOT VTIs, it's always a good idea to fan through with small micro movements as you're measuring a spectral Doppler tracing to make sure that you're catching the biggest and brightest envelope. Finally, it's worth noting that for patients in sinus rhythm, we should ideally be measuring three times and then taking an average of our readings. 
For patients in an irregular rhythm, such as atrial fibrillation, five measurements should be averaged. So here we start once again in our apical five chamber view. We apply color Doppler that helps us easily visualize the left ventricular outflow tract in the aortic valve. And then we place a continuous wave Doppler just past the aortic valve leaflets. We use continuous wave because it allows us to visualize higher velocities as may be seen in aortic stenosis. We will then obtain a spectral Doppler tracing and we can trace a VTI envelope as demonstrated here. This will then generate a maximal velocity as well as mean and maximal pressure gradients. As a second example, once again, we are in an apical five chamber view, somewhat more challenging this time. And once again, we use color Doppler as well as a continuous wave Doppler placed just past the calcified aortic valve leaflets. You can see that even in a difficult view, color helps us distinguish the left ventricular outflow tract. Once again, we obtain a bright spectral Doppler tracing envelope that we will use a VTI tracing to quantify. Now, as a reminder of the numbers that we care about for distinguishing severe aortic stenosis, we classify severe aortic stenosis as having a maximal velocity of over four meters per second and or a mean gradient of over 40 millimeters of mercury. We've not discussed the use of the continuity equation to obtain an aortic valve area in this podcast, but generally an aortic valve area of less than one is also considered severe. If we look back on our two examples, therefore, we can see that although they shared some of the same two-dimensional features of a calcified valve with reduced opening, our first example, we have a maximal velocity of just over two meters per second and a mean pressure gradient of less than 10 millimeters of mercury. This would therefore fall under the category of aortic sclerosis. In contrast with our second example, we have a maximal velocity of 4.6 meters per second, as well as a mean pressure gradient of 35 millimeters of mercury. This patient therefore has severe aortic stenosis, which should be carefully considered when managing her hemodynamics and titrating vasoactive medications. A brief word of caution about low cardiac output states. In cases of severely reduced myocardial contractility, you can underestimate the severity of aortic valve disease, given that reduced contractility will not be able to generate a pressure gradient that accurately reflects the severity of the stenosis. In the outpatient setting, these patients would be sent for a dobutamine stress echo. However, on the wards or in critically ill patients in the ICU, this is not practical. To evaluate these patients, we can use the dimensionless index. And for more information on this, I would direct you to Dr. Vincent Lau's excellent screencast on the dimensionless index found on the Western Sano site. A link to the screencast is found in the video description below. Finally, there are a few other situations in which the technique described in this video can be misleading such as the presence of concomitant aortic regurgitation or severe diastolic dysfunction. For a more complete list, I direct you to Dr. Robert Arnfield's Advanced Critical Care Echocardiography Handbook found on the westernsono.ca site, or the 2017 American Society of Echocardiography Guidelines for the Evaluation of Aortic Stenosis. Once again, see the video description below for links. In summary then, the presence of severe aortic stenosis is a clinically important question that can significantly affect the management of a patient and their hemodynamics, particularly in critically ill patients in the ICU. Our ability to distinguish this at the bedside is significantly enhanced by the use of bedside echocardiography compared to traditional physical exam findings. Be cautious with two-dimensional echo findings as these can be misleading and many findings are shared between aortic sclerosis and aortic stenosis. The question here truly lies in the use of spectral Doppler, which is an extension of the basic skills that we use to calculate cardiac output with the use of a continuous wave Doppler that allows us to identify the high velocity seen past the aortic valve. From there, we can obtain a mean pressure gradient as well as a Vmax that can answer our question about the presence of severe aortic stenosis. That's all for today, folks. Thanks for joining us here at Western Sano and happy scanning.